I've always liked Paul Tillich. He is a Christian philosopher and theologian who commented on the apostles Paul claim that the gospel is a stumbling block. And he said that the danger is actually stumbling over the wrong thing. And the same could be said of our parable today. It's difficult to avoid interpreting the parable in a straightforward way or even simplistic way because the dramatic action of this parable is just so predictable, right? We know that the Pharisees are regularly cast in the Gospels as Jesus' opposition, and we all too easily judge the Pharisee to be a self-righteous hypocrite and assume that the moral of the story is to be humble. Now, there's a good reason for this straightforward interpretation, as Luke seems to frame the parable in just these terms. But the difficulty with this interpretation is that we might as well end up preaching something like this. Lord, we thank you that we are not like other people. We're not like those who are hypocrites or overly pious or self-righteous or even like that Pharisee. We come to church each week, we listen attentively to Scripture, and we have learned that we should always be humble. Well, in order to avoid that kind of self-congratulatory reading of this parable, that the parable itself would seem to condemn, it may help to note that, in fact, everything that the Pharisee says in this parable is true. He has set himself apart from others by his faithful adherence to the law. He is, by the standards of both Luke and Jesus, righteous. So before we judge him too quickly, we might reframe his prayer slightly and wonder if we have uttered it ourselves. Maybe we haven't said, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other people. But what about seeing somebody down on their luck. We say, oh, there, but for the grace of God go I. Isn't that the Pharisee speaking falsely? Rather, it isn't that the Pharisee is speaking falsely, but rather that the Pharisee misses the true meaning of his blessing. As Luke states in his introductory sentence, he has trusted in himself. His prayer of gratitude may be spoken to God, but it's really all about him. He locates his righteousness entirely in his own actions and his own being instead of attributing that righteousness to God. The tax collector, on the other hand, knows that he possesses no means by which to claim righteousness. He has done nothing of merit. Indeed, he has done much to offend God. And so for this reason, he stands back, hardly daring to approach the temple and throws himself at the mercy of the Lord. And here lies the essential contrast. One makes claim to righteousness based on his own accomplishments, while the other relies entirely on the Lord's benevolence. Rather than be grateful for his blessings, the Pharisee appears kind of smug to the point of despising others. In his mind, there are only two kinds of people, the righteous and the immoral. And he is entirely grateful that he has placed himself among the righteous instead of the immoral. While the tax collector, on the other hand, isn't so much humble as desperate. He is so overwhelmed by his plight that he doesn't take any time to divide humanity into sides. All he recognizes as he stands near the temple is his own great need. The details of the tax collector's prayer, they are stark in contrast to that of the Pharisee, right? He stands far away seemingly so aware of his sins in the face of God that he knows that he doesn't deserve to stand near God's presence. And even more than that, he is physically downcast. 
He averts his eyes from where his help will come, and he makes a physical demonstration of his inward sorrow, of his sense of responsibility for his own sinfulness by beating his chest. And when he prays, he prays the penitent prayer that is heard throughout the Psalms. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector stakes his hopes and claims not on anything he has done, not on anything he deserves, but entirely on God. He puts himself entirely at the mercy of God. And I don't think it's an accident that this parable takes place in the temple. Because on the grounds of the temple, you were always intimately aware of who you were, of what status you had, and what you could expect from God. Right? The righteous, the wealthy, the people who were in positions of power and importance, they made it further into the temple. They were looked upon, they were given with awe, they were given room. At the temple, there were insiders and there were outsiders. And according to these rules, there was no question of where the Pharisee and the tax collector stood. But when Jesus dies, all of this changes. As the Gospels report, the curtain in the temple was torn in two, symbolically erasing all of the divisions of humanity before God. And so that act of, of tearing the curtain, it is prefigured here as God justifies not the one favored by temple law and human practice, but rather the one standing outside the temple gate with his eyes downcast and beating his chest, aware only of his own utter need. And this, this is what makes this parable so hard to interpret and so hard to preach. This is what makes this parable a trap. Because as soon as we fall prey to the temptation to divide humanity into any kind of groups, we've aligned ourselves squarely with the Pharisee. And so whether our division is between the righteous and the sinners, as with the Pharisee, or between the self-righteous and the humble, as Luke often talks about, we are doomed. Any time that we draw a dividing line between who's in and who's out, our parable tells us you will find God on the other side. And interpreted this way, it creates all kinds of problems for each and every one of us because we all love to draw lines. When it is read this way, the parable ultimately escapes even its narrative setting and reveals that it's not ultimately about self-righteousness and humility any more than it is about a pious Pharisee and a desperate tax collector. No, this parable is all about God. A God who judges the human heart. A God who is determined to justify, to forgive, to grant mercy to the ungodly. At the end of this story, the Pharisee will leave the temple and return to his home righteous, the same way that he entered the temple. That hasn't changed. He was righteous when he came up, comes up and he's righteous when he goes back. But the tax collector, on the other hand, will leave the temple and go back to his home justified he goes home unburdened. He goes home vindicated. He goes home in a restored relationship with God. And when Jesus says, this man went down to his home justified, we should imagine his words taking the audience's collective breath away, right? This man went down to his home justified. <gasps> because the tax collector is not the kind of person we might expect to be so easily restored. Beating his breast in sorrow, the man utters a simple request for mercy and confesses his sinfulness. He doesn't promise to change. The traitor to his people does not pledge to find a new job or join the resistance. It's all rather outrageous that God shows mercy so easily 
to such a villain. The grace on display here is so absurdly generous that we see the same kind of grace in the prodigal son return home. At the end of the day payment to all of the laborers in the vineyard. On what basis then is this tax collector named righteous? Entirely on the basis of God's divine mercy. The tax collector shows us someone who appears to begin, rather to be at the beginning on that road to transformation. If the tax collector did not trust God, then why would he turn to God in prayer? He could have fallen to the other extreme of the same sin as the Pharisee, right? On one hand, we have the Pharisee saying, I'm so righteous, I'm so mighty, I'm so good. And forgetting God. And on the other hand, the exact opposite sin, the same sin, but at the opposite end of the spectrum, is believing that we are so bad that there is no hope, that God, that no one can save us or forgive us, that I am so unworthy. But he doesn't. The tax collector still hopes in God. Instead, even with his eyes downcast, God lifts him up. And how hard is that? for us as human beings, right? When everything is going well, we pat ourselves on the back and we say, life is swell. Thank God I have made all the right choices. And when things are in shambles, we believe that we deserve it, that there's no possible way that anyone, much less God, for, could forgive us, that there's no way out, and yet, and yet this parable tells, tells us that we have nothing else to put our trust in but God. We have nothing to claim beyond our dependence upon God's mercy. And when we allow this to happen, when we can forget, if only for a moment, all of our human constructed divisions and pride, when we can just stand before God, aware of only our need, then we too are justified by the God of Jesus. We are invited to return to our homes, justified with mercy, grace, and gratitude. And that, my friends, that is good news indeed. Amen. Let us respond in song. Our hymn is number 226, Great God, Your Love Has Called Us Here, and it's sung by Mary Ann McVicker. <laughs> 